that is now recording. Um, right, uh, like I said, I was just gonna kind of take it section by section. So this fir first section then on physicalism pages, what is it, like three to nine. Um, so, so first of all, Strawson is, I take it, defining physicalism here. Actually, I guess I should say, just in case there's anybody, I mean, I'm not really sure what people's backgrounds are, right? But um, so Strawson's arguing, you know, the paper, Why Physicalism Entails Panpsychism. Just in case there's anyone who's not aware of this, panpsychism, um, at least as Strawson uses the term, is the view that uh, consciousness, mind, mentality, subjectivity is a, a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the universe. Uh, it's, it's like charge or mass. Um, you know, like it, it, even something like an electron has mental properties, has experiential properties. Obviously, nobody's arguing that electrons experience emotions or beliefs or anything like that, but they, they, even something like an electron is going to have some very simple experiential properties. So um, it's quite a quite a radical view, uh, you know, quite a surprising view. Strawson's going to argue that physicalism entails this rather surprising view. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to disagree with my characterization of panpsychism. Uh, I think uh, I think that's a pretty fair characterization. I'd say like a panpsychist can be kind of agnostic to what to the character of the experience of an electron, I guess, but that the like that the key thing is that there needs to be some experienceness to electrons if experience is going to emerge at all in larger structures. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's the kind of just the background here, and uh, this first section on physicalism. Um, so, so one of the things Strawson claims here is that. Firstly, what he's calling a, uh, you know, a real physicalist or realistic physicalist has to acknowledge the reality of experience, consciousness, phenomenology, uh, what it's likeness, um, feeling, sensation, and the other things he says on that first page. Uh, so, in order to be um, in order to be sensible, that's just something that we, we just have to accept. Uh, that's m more obvious than anything else, is the existence of, of experience. Um, and the, the other thing that's going to be involved in being a realistic physicalist uh, is the, I guess, standard physicalist view that ultimately there's sort of, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing more to our experience than what's going on in our brains and maybe other parts of our bodies. But but certainly like, you know, once you've got a brain, that's gonna be enough to have experience. So we're not postulating like, you know, strange non-physical souls or anything like that. Um, where does Strawson say this? It's on uh, page, um, page seven, Strawson says, you know, as a as a re as a real physicalist, uh, I hold the mental experientialist physical, and I'm, and I'm happy to say, along with many other physicalists, that experience is really just neurons firing, um, at least in the case of biological organisms like ourselves. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know any thoughts on on that. I mean, I think that those those are the two main things that Strawson is asserting here uh, is that, that first of all we we, we must uh, hold that experience is a real phenomenon and you know we can't kind of go in for uh, eliminativist views that, that try to kind of explain away experience um, mm -hmm. but secondly all there is to experience are the let's say normal physical processes mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. Any any comments or? I think that the or... um, there's nothing more to experience than the normal physical processes. Yeah. Like at face value, it's hard to think that makes sense. But the way he develops it on the paper and the way he defines physical processes makes a bit more sense. I think the like maybe a source of discomfort here could be that like maybe his definition of physical is too broad. Like maybe yeah. 
Um, but he does acknowledge that he'd be fine with calling his monism like experiential and non-experiential monism or whatever. But it does feel like maybe some of the some of the debates that would be going on would be framing like physicalism differently. Yeah, I mean, so this is like I can kind of understand why somebody might feel let down after having read the title <laughs> and then reading Strawson's characterization of what physicalism actually is, uh, according to him. In fact, he even says um, on page eight that, like he said, he says, uh, you know, um, OK, what, uh, towards the towards the bottom, he basically just accepts that there is a sense in which his use of the term physical is vacuous. Uh, right. <laughs> um, but but his idea then is that so the reason why he's using the term physical um, I'm quoting again from page eight is because because I take physical to be a natural kind term whose reference I can sufficiently indicate by drawing attention to tables and chairs and as a realistic physicalist experiential phenomena so you know there really are experiential phenomena, experiential phenomena are going to be physical, so you can just point to all that stuff. Chairs, tables, experiential phenomena, and that's going to fix the reference of the term physical. Um, I mean, I guess maybe this is designed to sort of just rule out things like gods and ghosts. ghosts. Souls. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, one obvious worry about this is that that's not going to capture everything that a lot of physicalists want to capture because uh, a lot of physicalists will assert that there really are uh, abstract mathematical entities, for instance, because those entities are assumed uh, in our best theories of physics or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So, so on, on the one hand, there's a worry that his use of the term is, is too broad. And then maybe there's also a worry that it's actually too narrow because it's if you're just if you're pointing to stuff in order to uh, fix the reference of the term, then you're going to be pointing to concrete entities, and we might want to use the term more broadly than that. Um, I also think that the list he gives is a little. It's it's interesting. It made me, but it's hard to see the pattern. Like if you mention like chairs and tables and cars and trees and things like that, like. You can kind of see what natural kind those could all belong to. And mm -hmm. if you include like brains, neurons, molecules, atoms, like you, I still see a natural kind there. But as soon as you introduce experiences, that just seems like heterogeneous to me. But I don't know if that's just like Descartes dogma back in my brain or if it's really like, or if it's really actually like heterogeneous enough to not um, fit as a kind. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, so that's what Strawson is going to say, right? That um, mm -hmm. that it is just a dogma. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I mean, Descartes' greatest mistake, I think, is what he calls mm -hmm. that kind of thinking. Um, I mean, so I guess he does make a point about this, actually, that, well, uh, he develops in more detail in the next section. But um, on page four, he says, uh, yeah, we have no good reason to think that we know anything about the physical that gives us any reason to find any problem in the idea that experiential phenomena are physical phenomena. Um, <laughs> I mean, so, so I suppose just, it, 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 you know, so I, I can see why there might be th this worry about the list that Strawson gives, but I mean, I guess the idea is, look, if you're going to be a physicalist, then ultimately you have to say that everything is physical and uh, if you're going to be a realistic physicalist, then you've got to accept that there really are experiences and subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And so that's got to be physical as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So so we can just point to that as well as exemplifying what the physical is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's did I just say something that was sort of circular there or I don't know. I, I think it yeah. makes sense. Like uh, there's there's still like discomfort somewhere with with the way he puts physicalism but um like i think it makes sense within the paper and i don't really know exactly how to articulate the discomfort if that makes sense doesn't it doesn't feel like an error it just feels like a like there's a bit like something a bit of slate of hand maybe i don't know yeah um but then you know it's it is difficult to define physicalism in general i, oh, I think this yeah, is this is not a problem unique to strawson um, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. Uh, so I guess we can just go go with him. Um, I don't know any any other comments on the on the first section um, because that was, I think, pretty much all I had to say about that. Uh, 
guess there's no other thoughts on that then. So move on to the uh, second section. Um, okay, yeah. So I think there's okay. There's quite a lot going on here. First of all, um, this list of assumptions, these three assumptions. I'm I'm not sure that these are particularly important. I mean, actually, Strawson himself says he doesn't think he needs them. Um, but I guess it, he introduces some terminology that he uses later in the paper. So first, I, first, first assumption is there's a plurality of ultimates where an ultimate is just a fundamental physical entity, um, string, brain, simple, field, whatever you want to call it, particle, whatever. Um, everything physical is constituted out of ultimates of the sort we have in our universe, and the universe is spatiotemporal in its fundamental nature. Um, I mean, I, I guess pretty much every physicalist would accept that sort of claim. I, like I said, I don't, I don't know if there's anything that important about these assumptions. Um, it, it sort of just seems to be a bit, you know, defining physicalism a bit further. Um, mm -hmm. Any comments on that? Or? I, I didn't see him like using the premises later, but I do think that they were good for like kind of getting a better picture of what. Mm -hmm. um, what are the bounds of physicalism? Yeah, I don't think he does. I don't think that these, I mean, like I say, it seems to just be defining physicalism a bit more. I, but then he says himself, he doesn't seem, he doesn't need this for his argument. Um, yeah, so then after this, he presents an argument which uh, he attributes to Eddington and also Russell. And okay, there's there's a, a lot of stuff going on here. Um, so this is sort of bottom of page nine onto page 10. Um, so, so, the, so, so first of all then, at the bottom of page nine, we, we have this quote. Um, One thing we know about physical stuff, given that real physicalism is true, is that when you put it together in a way uh, in which it is put together in brains like ours, it regularly constitutes, it literally is experience like ours. So we know that in the right combinations, physical stuff, the physical particles make experience. Um, mm. Yeah, that plainly follows from what he said so far. So, um, and another thing we know about it, let us grant, is everything true that physics tells us. But what is this second kind of knowledge like? Um, so, the, the argument that Russell and Eddington make is that the kind of knowledge that we get from physics is knowledge of uh, abstract, structural, uh, relational properties of matter. Um, I, I mean, I guess I guess one way to put this is that physics describes how an electron, for instance, will behave and how it will relate to other things, but it can't describe the intrinsic properties of the electron. It can only describe its its relational properties. It can only describe how it how it interacts with other things. Um, so the thought that it's that there's, there's an argument which I guess we might summarize uh, as follows. Um, you can't know the intrinsic properties of fundamental physical particles, uh, at least on the basis of the sort of uh, you know, experiments and so on that we do in physics. But <laughs> It's the intrinsic properties of those particles. It's it, it's 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 the intrinsic properties of them that are going to account for experience. Um, it's the intrinsic. So, uh, experientiality is an intrinsic property. Um, obviously, as a result of our experiences, we will behave in various ways. That's relational. But you know, when we when we open our eyes and look at a red book there's you know something it's like to see the redness and that's not a relational property the that that immediate experience of redness right that's just an intrinsic property of the experience it's not a relational property um so yeah so we we, we can't know the intrinsic properties of atoms uh, experientiality is an intrinsic property and so it's going to be the intrinsic properties that account for experience and the difficulty we 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 have in fitting experience into the physical world arises from the fact that physics doesn't take into account the intrinsic properties of uh, fundamental particles. Mm -hmm. um, I think, 
yeah, go ahead. Um, I think his distinction between like physicalism and physicsalism. Yeah. Um, it's a little like jokey, but I I think that's like a very clear way to to draw out um, the approach that the physicalist has, and also why like other people would say, oh no, the physicalist can't get the mental because the physicalist is only handling the the relations. But he's saying no. Well, if you're a real physicalist, um, you're gonna you're gonna be able to look for the experience, and maybe it's an intrinsic property of the physical. Yeah. So. I mean, from from the point of view of you know, the the real physicalist, I suppose it's not it's not surprising that uh, that we kind of can't account for experience in terms of physics because well, experience is this intrinsic property, and physics just doesn't deal with the intrinsic properties of things. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's I mean there's then I, I guess a way to push this a bit further, um, which is. Well, okay, let, let's just sort of state uh, a panpsychist position here. A panpsychist will say something like, okay, physics tells us how an electron behaves. So it tells us the relational properties or the structural properties or whatever. But in and of itself, right, one of the intrinsic properties of an electron is that it's the kind of thing that has mind, consciousness, experience. And um, I mean, the point of somebody like Eddington, the the argument from someone like Eddington would be, well, look, the the only intrinsic properties that we have access to are the intrinsic properties of our brains, and those are experiential properties. Mm -hmm. That's the only clue that we actually have as to the intrinsic nature of matter, um, and and so Eddington would say, you know, it is silly, it's silly, given that we know nothing from physics about the intrinsic nature of matter to suppose that its intrinsic properties are non-experiential. And then that raises this puzzle about, well, where the, like, how does experience arise from all of this? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's, like, um, I think that's, at least at face value, I think it's pretty intuitive where you think, okay, we have this gap in intrinsic properties for, like, um, atoms and electrons, like, as they are in themselves, as, as they are not just as they relate to to our instruments, but as they are in themselves, and how the only intrinsic properties we're acquainted with, or directly acquainted with, are the ones in our experience. So mm -hmm. we'd postulate, oh well, why postulate a foreign third kind of intrinsic property? Like maybe their intrinsic properties are just like the ones um, in our experience. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's basically yeah. it. Um, so, well, I mean, as I guess Eddington concludes, <laughs> I'm, I may expect that the background of other pointer readings in physics is of a nature continuous with that which is revealed to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, oh. I mean, th sorry? Oh, no, uh, I, I hadn't thought of the, like, nature continuous to that which is revealed to me. That's, um, I hadn't thought of that phrase very much. Sorry, I'll let you continue. <laughs> um, no, I think that was, that was basically it. Um, um, yeah, so, okay then, so, so just to summarise how at least I'm understanding this, this argument, um, experientiality is, so premise one, experientiality is an intrinsic property, which is, to, so the intrinsic properties of brain states are revealed to us. Premise two, we can't know the intrinsic properties of fundamental particles on the basis of physics, because physics only reveals the structure and relations. Um, three, it's the intrinsic properties of fundamental particles that are going to play a role in accounting for experience. Um, and, and the difficulty of fitting experience into the physical world comes from the fact that we don't take into account these, these hidden intrinsic properties. Um, and f furthermore, I guess we should expect, as Eddington says, the, the intrinsic properties of fundamental particles are of a nature continuous with that revealed to me. Um, so, I don't know, that there's, yeah, I think there's kind of a lot going on here, but I, I think that's what the, the argument is here. Which is interesting, because this is kind of like a, you know, Strawson gives his own argument, but this is in itself, it seems, an argument for panpsychism. Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any other comments on that point? Um, I think, um, 
I might be like jumping the gun here, but I think one potential objection one could have is to say like, well, why would we suppose that um, physical things have intrinsic properties if physical things as they are in physics only have those um, relational properties? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be because it seems like we're kind of taking advantage of the fact that I, I'm trying to find the right words, but it, it doesn't feel like um, like electrons would need to have intrinsic properties. Like it, that doesn't seem to be necessitated by anything. So it looks like we're looking at a gap that we could exploit to get mentality. Um, so I think that's something a skeptic might uh, might push harder on and say, well, why do you think that electrons have intrinsic properties? Yeah. Like it's awfully convenient that they have intrinsic properties, so you can fill that gap with um, experience and mentality. Yeah, I get. So, what would the um, so I guess the the worry would be that uh, if we if we're saying they only have uh, yeah, relational properties. Um, oh, okay. So I, I, I can I, I I'm I'm I think I can remember an argument here about dispositional properties, but you might not accept mm -hmm. that all relational properties are dispositional properties. But <laughs> so um, there, there there is a view. Uh, where we say that like all properties are really just dispositional properties um and i think the standard argument against that if i'm i hope i state this correctly but it's something like for any for any disposition we can understand like the nature of that disposition only any only when we understand how it manifests itself um so you know you you understand what it is to be uh like you know soluble right only when you know what happens when something goes into you know water and, and dissolves and you you understand what it is um to be fragile only when you know what shattering is um if you say that all prop that that, all, that at a fundamental level all properties are just dispositions then the manifestation of a property is just going to be some other disposition um, oh. And then the manifestation of that's going to be some other disposition. And I, now I'm not sure if the same argument could be generalized to all relational properties. And I'm I'm not sure if that argument made sense. But that's just what. Okay, that that's that's as good as I can do off the top of my head. Uh, I think I, I see the shape of it. I'll have yeah. to think about it. Yeah. Um. That that might not have been a very good presentation of that. Um. But I, I, I that's maybe one one sort of our answer to your question uh but yeah i mean no it's a, it's 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 a good question right like we're just we're assuming that that these things have intrinsic properties and that's not just obvious uh so uh yeah okay so I, just to um i guess put this in you know strawson's words strawson's conclusion in the form of a uh, question on page 11 he says you know why then on what conceivable grounds do so many physicalists simply assume that the physical in itself is essentially and wholly a non-experiential phenomenon um and actually i guess that's maybe another way to to answer your question which is to say well you know look i'm i'm not necessarily claiming that it's uh that, that it is experiential but there's there's a challenge here to the standard physicalist who wants to say that it's not experiential. Like, what possible reason could there be for uh, for thinking that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, so so we then get uh, these sort of two views that, that that Strawson states, which he labels N E and uh, RP. So he says, many physicalists accept NE, which is the claim that physical stuff is in itself, in its fundamental nature, something wholly and utterly non-experiential. Um, and realistic physicalists accept RP, which says that experience is a real concrete phenomenon. Every real concrete phenomenon is physical. Um, so, the standard physicist, or at least a standard realistic physicalist, is going to accept both of these claims, uh, at least according to Strawson. Um, any thoughts think, on that? I think 
I think you would say that a realistic physicalist would accept the second one without accepting the first one, but that a physicalist that isn't a real physicalist um, will want to have both of them, um, but will would only be able to do it with brute emergence. I think, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Oh well, I so I thought that being realistic in one's physicalism simply amounted to like acknowledging the reality of experience um yeah and yeah. hand holding that you know, experience is is physical um yeah i think a, a better way to word um I, I i think i said it wrong uh to word it better a real physicalist will need to endorse rp yes. experience is a real concrete phenomenon and every real concrete phenomenon is physical but if they also endorse an e um physical stuff is um non-experiential then they're going to run into trouble. Yeah, I yeah. think that's what Strawson. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's I think Strawson's yeah Strawson's argument. Um, okay, yeah. So that's that's section two. Uh, all right then. Um, section three. Uh, and look, well, unless there's anything anyone wants to say about section two, I will move on to section three. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so this. This is a pretty long section, this one, and I mean, I... Okay, I guess I'll, I'll just summarise what I take to be the, the, the main takeaway from this whole section, because he does, you know, as I say, this, this is kind of a long section, um, but it contains the, the heart of the paper, which I, I guess we could call uh, the anti-emergence argument. Um, so, first of all, Strawson says, well, you know, can we hold both RP and NE together, um, and he doesn't think so, right? So the point of this is going to be that RP and NE are incompatible, and I take it that the basic argument here is is just this. RP and NE together entail what Strawson is calling brute emergence, but brute emergence is unacceptable, so you know we can't hold both of them. And, um, you know, obviously we're assuming physicalism for the purpose of this paper, so we have to give up NE, um, which means we have to give up the claim uh, that, um, what exactly was it? Uh, just to state it precisely, where did I write this down? Ah, yeah, so uh, physical stuff is in, its, in itself, in its fundamental nature, something wholly and utterly non-experiential. We're going to have to give up that claim, which means physical stuff is something wholly and utterly experiential in its fundamental nature. Um, that's the general argument that Strawson is giving in this section. Uh, uh, can you repeat the last sentence you said, because um, cut out halfway through. Okay, sorry, yeah, so... Um, uh, what was the last se sentence? I okay. Uh, um, General argument the and then you said something. Yeah, so ge general argument the Strawson's giving is RP and NE together entail brute emergence, but brute emergence is unacceptable. Um, we're assuming RP for the purposes of this argument, so we have to give up NE. Uh, NE being the claim that physical stuff is in its fundamental nature something wholly and utterly non-experiential. We have to give up <laughs> that claim. Um, so that's just me sort of summarising this part of the paper. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, so what, any sort of general comments on, on this, or should we kind of get into the details of the argument? Um, I have some comments, but they're just about the whole section three, so... Okay, maybe, well, yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. we'll, I don't know, come back to them later then, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so, first of all, uh, the standard defence, at least according to Strawson, of holding both RP and NE is to say that experience, experiential phenomena are emergent. Uh, and the standard example of emergence, um, or at least a standard example which Strawson gives, is liquidity. So uh, a H2O molecule on its own, or, or you know, even a bunch of H2O molecules just on their own, are not liquid. But when you put a bunch of H2O molecules together, you get liquidity. So you get these macroscopic properties emerging from the relations between um, you know, various molecules. Um, so the, the macroscopic property of liquidity emerges from these, I guess, simpler properties. Um, that's a standard example. 
Um, and then Strawson gives this other example of uh, oil and convection cells. Um, so I don't know, any, any questions or comments on emergence? I mean, I think it's a fairly straightforward idea, at least in the case of liquidity. Uh, yeah. So, so the problem then is that Strawson just doesn't think that, well, Strawson doesn't think this, this, this analogy is appropriate. Um, and the key argument here uh, is that liquidity, he says, is wholly dependent on phenomena that do not in themselves involve liquidity at all. Uh, so, uh, where is it? So page, yeah, page, page 14. Um, he says that um, it seems plain there must be some fundamental sense in which any emergent phenomenon, say, say Y, is wholly dependent on that which it emerges from, say, X. Um, uh, 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 it seems, in fact, that this must be true by definition of emergent, for if, for if there is not this total dependence, then it will not be true after all, not true without qualification to say that Y is emergent from X, for in this case, at least some part or aspect of Y will have to hail from elsewhere, and it will therefore not be emergent from X. So that's not what's going on with liquidity. Liquidity is wholly dependent on the interactions of the H2O molecules. Um, and it's that it's this point about dependence that Strawson thinks is problematic. He thinks it's going that we, we, we that we're going to have trouble describing or thinking of experiential phenomena as being wholly dependent uh, on non-experiential phenomena. Um, and he kind of, he gives an argument um, on the bottom of page fourteen, which he no longer accepts. Um, I guess we can talk about that if you want, but I'm. But what his his point that he accepts now um, seems to be that there must be, uh, yeah. So so that there there must be something about uh, where is this? Okay, uh, think... page fifteen. Oh, do you want to go ahead okay. and say something? Yeah. Um, oh no, I was just going to say. I think a very clear way of putting it that that he uses is um, that emergence is a an in virtue of relation? Yes, yes. Yeah. Where is that? Yeah. Where does that occur? In that's a... virtue. Um, that's page 19 oh, under okay. the all caps section. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what those all caps were about. Um, I think it was just a. Yeah. It was just like really harsh emphasis. I kind of feel like, I mean, I don't know. I like Strawson as a writer, but I, I sort of feel like he goes on a little bit in this section. I'm not sure it needed to be this long. Um, mm hmm. But yeah, yeah, so the, the in virtue of, so this is like way down on page 19. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Y must arise out of or be given an X in some essentially uh, non-arbitrary, am I reading the right thing here? Uh, oh yeah, it's, it's so uh, Y must arise out of or be given in X in some essentially non-arbitrary and indeed wholly non-arbitrary way X has to have something to do. Ha, X to ha, has has to have something. Indeed, everything to do with it. That's what emerging is. Um, it's essentially an in virtue of relation. It cannot be brute. Um, for Y to emerge from X, X must have something to do with it. Uh, other, otherwise, it's brute. And he gives these analogies um, in the earlier pages. So uh, I think if you go back to page um, fifteen, I think he he gives a few few analogies of. Uh, brute emergence that is problematic. So um, we can we can kind of understand the emergence of liquidity from H2O molecules. But now imagine uh, somebody who claims that all concrete entities, are, like all, all of the fundamental concrete ultimates, to use Strawson's terminology, are unextended and extension emerges from the relations between them. Um, or uh, another analogy he gives is the claim that all concrete ultimates are wholly non-spatial, and that when in the right when in the right non-spatial relations, they give rise to spatial phenomena. It just seems like we can't make sense of that. Um, you know, you can't you can't get uh, spatial relations from non-spatial relations. Uh, um, 
he uses this technical terminology actually where he says that this is on page 15 and I think on a couple of other pages he says that uh, in the case of liquidity and H2O molecules we move within a completely conceptually homogeneous uh, non-heterogeneous set of notions um, so liquidity and H2O molecules are conceptually homogeneous notions I'm not entirely sure what he means by that um, Anyone there have any? Do you have any thoughts on what he meant by that? Because I, I, a couple of ideas would yeah. be like they use the same kinds of terms, so they are going to be using terms like um, shape, size, distance. Um, yes. So purely, purely things from non-experiential vocabulary, purely things from like relational um, physics vocabulary. So I guess like the the sort of vocabulary and concepts that you will be handling for the non-liquid phenomena and for the liquid phenomena, it seems, this is very gut feel, but it feels like they're kind of the same sort of thing. It's a lot less magical than the like non-experience to experience case. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, maybe you might look at it like, and I, well, just to, I guess, elaborate on what you said is that you can kind of imagine there being a, a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence you can almost imagine, like, I don't know, graphing uh, both H2O molecules and liquidity. And um, I don't know, like, like like you say, it's in terms of shape, size, distance. It's in terms of those notions. Whereas if you're talking about spatial and non-spatial relations, mm -hmm. um, well, you can't do that. I don't know. Um, I'm not, I'm Maybe not sure. like another... Just... Oh. Um, you can go ahead, sorry. No, no, I, I think I was pretty much finished, so <laughs> yeah, go, oh, go ahead. I was going to say maybe another way to illustrate it, I don't know if it's correct, but um, any phenomenon involving liquids, you could write it, it would be cumbersome, but you could write mm -hmm. it as a phenomenon just involving like the individual molecules. Yes. And it would be a lot less elegant, but um, you would be able to write it, which doesn't happen in the spatial case. I didn't yeah. like his example about extendedness, because I do think it's like plausible... I, don't know, I feel like he didn't give much argument against the possibility of unextended making up an extended thing. I, I yeah. understand why it seems like you wouldn't be able to, but it also seems like if you have a line, if you have a continuum, you have an uncountable infinity of points there, which if you take them all away, the line is gone. So, Yeah, yeah I didn't quite get that either. Because if you have, like, well, like you say, if you have a bunch of points in, like, once you've got two points even if they're not extended, there's a distance between them. And so isn't that an extension? I I wasn't sure about that, but... I think the idea might have been that if you have points, no matter how many points you put in between two points, you're never going to be able to fill in the gap. Okay, but I think, yeah. that's, I think that's kind of assuming that you can only put uh, countably, infinitely many points between the two points. In that case, you're never going to be able to make a length. But if you can put uncountably many i think you can make a length but i think this is like going down the road of philosophy of continuity which i do not know anything about um no i i, I don't either so i can't, i can't comment on that um um but yeah I, I well i it's it's interesting actually that you you brought up that that point because one of the things that strawson notes himself uh is that he is basically just making an appeal to intuition here. Um, I mean, in fact, so on, on page 16, uh, he brings up uh, what we might call the objection from physics, uh, where, the, where the objection says, well, well, actually, uh, the view that extension, so the view that all kind of fundamental ultimates are non-extended is, is actually part of scientific orthodoxy now. So we should just accept that extension emerges from non-extension. Um, and Strawson says, well, you know, look, if one is being metaphysically straight, uh, the intuition that nothing, concrete, spatio-temporal, can exist at a, at a mathematical point because there just isn't any room is rock solid. Um, I mean, I don't know. Is it rock solid? How do we, how do we decide? <laughs> uh, so that that so yeah, this is it. It rests. I, I mean, his argument basically rests on appeal to intuition here. Um, and what if you don't share that intuition? Um, so. To like to be fully transparent, I completely share his intuition that um, brute emergence just doesn't work in the case of 
um, non-experiential to experiential things. Mm -hmm. Like it, it just doesn't make sense. It's not intelligible. But I think that the emergence to the extended from the non-extended is intelligible. So I think they're um, like it. Um, but I, I do agree that it does end up relying on intuitions. Well, I, I, I lost my train there. I mean, I guess the worry here is. Like, so Strawson's argument, as you said, it relies on intuitions, but the exam, so he's given an example where, I mean, he has the intuition that, hey, this is just inte unintelligible, right? We can't make sense of uh, extension emerging from non-extension, but then it seems like we have a different intuition. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, there's, there's a worry that like, you know, okay, people are just going to have different intuitions about things. Um, <laughs> you know, why should we put any weight on that? I mean, but maybe one way to think about this is to say, well, you know, what if somebody somebody just said, oh, no, you actually can't get liquidity from H2O molecules. I just can't make sense of that. I, like, that's just re totally unintuitive to me. Um, how would you show that person that they're wrong? I mean, you know, if they don't have the intuition, they don't have the intuition, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, don't... <laughs> I hadn't thought of, yeah, yeah. No, I hadn't thought of that possibility. It is, it does make it, it is pretty difficult to try to articulate, like, um to try to articulate like where where the boundary lies between like acceptable kinds and unacceptable kinds of emergence because i do for example the non-spatial to spatial one i fully agree that like that one can't happen yeah but it's hard to, it's kind of hard for me to articulate articulate exactly why that one's accept uh, that one's unacceptable but the ex unextended to extended one is acceptable yeah um no i mean i i i think i share your attitude on that one like i i can't make sense of the emergence of the spatial from the non-spatial i suppose i just wonder what the you know what what's the epistemological force of that um mm -hmm. does that tell us something about the world or does it just tell us something about i don't know how human minds tend to work or something like that um so yeah i mean but but so yeah that's maybe a, a worry about the uh, the argument that strawson is giving um okay uh so what next as i say this is so this is a fairly long section i think that's that's so that's that's one of the key parts of uh strawson's argument and then um so the, so uh yeah if we then go to page 18 um strawson's strawson says here look uh emergence can't be brute um there must be something about x in virtue of which you know y emerges from x um and the problem is if you're saying that spatial relations for instance emerge from non-spatial relations you're going to have brute emergence you're not going to be able to specify so you're not going to be able to specify the like in virtue of relation you're not going to be able to specify what it is about the non the non-spatial relations in virtue of which the spatial relations emerge from it. Um, I think uh, even even better for Strawson, if you were able to give an argument for how successfully like um, spatial could come from the non-spatial or whatever, then it wouldn't be brute because if it's like a good complete argument, then you would be saying like how um, one can come about in virtue of the other. Yes, yes, I see. Um... So in that case, uh, where are we? Um, yeah, so in, in that case, you uh, wouldn't then have an analogy to uh, experience and like non-experience, right? So even, even if you could show that the spatial emerged from the non-spatial, uh, the, well, I guess the answer would be is like, okay, well, that, that's not an appropriate analogy. Um, <laughs> you know, we have to go, because, we're gonna. The point is, is that in the case of uh, experience and non-experience, experience emerging from the non-experiential, it's brute. It's brute emergence. Mm -hmm. There isn't going to be any feature of the non-experiential, like in virtue of which the experiential emerges. Um, mm -hmm. I think. I, I guess that's the the basic point, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if that's if that's true, then if you accept both, um, you know, the reality of experience, and you accept 
NE, and remember that NE was the claim that physical stuff is in itself, in its fundamental nature, something wholly and utterly non-experiential, then you are committed to brute emergence, which Strawson thinks is uh, nonsensical. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's the basic argument right there. Um, and uh, he then, I mean, he has this nice uh, point that he then makes at the bottom of page 19, where he says, well, you know, given the fact that experience is an undeniable reality, uh, and given the fact that this in combination with NE uh, entails brute emergence, why on earth would you ever commit yourself to NE? Like, what's the, what's the point of that? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're, uh, well, as he continues on into the next page, by committing yourself to the existence of, uh, to, to, to NE, right, you're committing yourself to something for which there is no evidence whatsoever and that ends up saddling you with brute emergence. Um, <laughs> and he thinks that's, that's silly. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, well, that's, any thoughts on that? I mean, that's, that's Strawson's main argument, um, I think, the non-emergence, anti-emergence argument. I think, like, I found it very persuasive, but I was also, like, already not a fan of Emergence, so I don't know if I was just, like, agreeing because I already agreed. But I, I do think, um, especially, like, his... I think he illustrates really well why Brute Emergence is unacceptable. So, like, in the passage where he goes, oh, if Emergence can be Brute, then it is fully intelligible to suppose that non-physical soul stuff can arise out of physical stuff. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Wait, that's page 19, I think, isn't it? Yes, yeah. that's uh, halfway through page 19, right next to footnote 34. Yeah. And I think, like, that's just, that's a really vivid way of putting it. Um, and I think, yeah, his his um, objections to emergence, I think, are very clear and intuitive. Yeah, so it's, it, if if you accept brute emergence, then it's it's like anything goes. Um, well, it, brutality rules out nothing, uh, as he puts <laughs> it, you know, that... Um, you can just basically populate the world with with anything and just say, well, it's you know, brute emergence. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the question then is just going to be whether he's done enough to show that the emergence of experiential from non-experiential uh, phenomena would be brute. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, well, I guess I've I've already mentioned my c concerns that one might have about the appeal to intuition. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know. It, yeah, I mean, so uh, do you, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, do you think that's a it's a good argument? Um... I think so. Um, since uh, premise the ne the premise physical stuff is in itself in its fundamental nature wholly and utterly non experiential. It just it's hard because uh, I I feel like all I can say is I agree with this intuition like very mm -hmm. strongly, very viscerally. Um, like I agree very strongly that if if there's nothing experiential in any form or sense, uh, then the experiential can't just emerge. Like, or maybe the experiential experientialness <laughs> to <laughs> to make an um, adjective or noun out of it um, is very different from like liquidity or from maybe from extendedness. Yeah. Um, so I, I I do think it succeeds, but I. Um, maybe if someone was like really like bent on insisting that no, no, you can have non-brood emergence, like I would like to hear their reason. Um, because if you can't give me a reason for how something that doesn't have any A in it gets A in it by being arranged a certain way, I, I will want a reason for it. Because, yeah, like Strawson says, if we allow for something to emerge from something else without any reason whatsoever, then we're allowing like anything to emerge from anything. And then it doesn't even seem like emergence it just seems like yeah. magic conjunction i mean um I, I i i think i share the intuition uh like in the case of h2o molecules and liquidity i can i don't know maybe one way to put it is that i can almost like have a picture of it and you can yeah and and even if the picture that you have isn't right you can you can almost have a sort of possible picture of how this might work like if you imagine a bunch of balls uh, jiggling around and kind of sliding past each other um, 
and I've, I, I don't know, is that a double entendre? But uh, we'll have to go with this. But there's lots of them, loads of loads of balls. Uh, you can see how you could like put another object into that, right? And then if you kind of imagine that on a very, very small scale, you're like, oh, okay, a liquid is lots of little molecules banging around. And that's a very, again, that's like massively simplified. That's not really what's going on, but it's what could be going on. So you've got a picture of how it works. Um, you certainly, I mean, yeah. well, you certainly can't picture that in the case of experience. Um, so the intuition is powerful. Uh, I, yeah. I guess I just, I don't know, maybe I just don't put as much weight on those sorts of intuitions. I, I'm more inclined to just adopt a sort of agnostic position and say, okay, well, you know, we don't know how experience arises. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, it's, it's an intuitive argument, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, any other comments on, on this section? Um, I think that was all I had to say about it. Um, any more? No? Okay. So. Or maybe one last consideration is that um, even if we, even if, for example, someone couldn't make intuitive sense of how H2O, uh, sorry, liquidity could come from individual H2O particles, it does seem like if they were explained the connection, they would like agree to it or understand it. Um, yeah, so I well, think that's that explainability um, is the thing. But maybe I'm just pushing things back to a question of, oh, well, what if someone doesn't agree with the explanation? Yeah, you see, that's the sort of thing. That's what gets me. It's like, well, yeah, but what if, I mean, what if they didn't? Would we just say that that person is like, I don't know, like has a cognitive deficiency somehow? I mean, like it, it seems logically possible at least that there could be a person who's perfectly intelligent and perfectly capable of reasoning who just genuinely finds it completely unintelligible like i did i don't know i don't know how to rule that out and then you can you can simply imagine like a race of brilliantly intelligent aliens who have who just understand how you can get uh, the experiential emerging from the non-experiential <laughs> and they can't explain it to us um, yeah, I think like one move it does uh, the one move the paper does grant us though is the like as long as you haven't explained to me how it's gonna emerge from it, then I'm not gonna accept your emergence. And I think that's like a that's I think a legitimate way to warrant that. Yeah, um, it put up or shut up, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one way to put it. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, all right, then, should we move on to the next section, uh, section four? Um, so, well, actually, uh, it's interesting because Strawson does uh, mention himself at the beginning of this section, this point, well, he's appealed to intuition, um, and, you know, what if people just reject the intuition? He says, you know, some may insist, some may insist again that they find nothing intolerable in the idea that S phenomena, and here he means spatial phenomena, can be emergent properties of something wholly non-spatial. They may add that they feel the same about uh, the experiential emerging from the wholly non-experiential. Um, so, I, I, I think his point then is, well, in this case, in order for this emergence to work, right, it requires that the non-spatial phenomena, so just, you know, to carry on with this, the, the analogy to spatial phenomena here before moving on to the experiential, it, it would require that the non-spatial phenomena are somehow uh, specially suited, I think he says, or intrinsically suited to constituting spatial phenomena. They're mm -hmm. proto-spatial. Um, but, I mean, but basically, you know, to summarise what he says here, the, the general issue is going to be... Um, I think he says this, I think this is on page 22, but basically he says, you know, that if, if proto, um, if, if that kind of proto-spatial means like not spatial, but whatever is needed for spatiality, then you, you haven't really bridged the gap. Whereas if it yeah. means spatial, but very different from, you know, it's just like different spatial properties, well, then you've just got spatial properties all the way down. Um, and the same is yeah. going to be true for the, the experiential case. If you try to appeal yeah. to like proto-experiential things, it's either going to mean not experiential, but what is needed for experience, which just doesn't tell us anything, or it's going to mean experiential, but very different from our experience, which is just to accept panpsychism. Um, yeah. 
so he doesn't think that's going to work. Um, actually, he also makes a, an interesting point about that liquidity analogy here, because he says, uh, you know, the minute you the minute you offer the liquidity analogy, you see it's an, you see it's an inadequacy, because analyzed in terms of p properties which are like non-experiential physical properties liquid bodies of water and h2o molecules have exactly the same sort of properties they're made of exactly the same stuff um like when you when you give an account of how the liquidity emerges from the non-liquidity you show that there actually aren't any new properties involved at all yeah um so in, in, in the same way, if you were to show how experien experientiality emerged from non-experientiality, -experien you'd show that there weren't really any new properties involved at all. You'd show that there was just experience all along. Um, yeah, which would contradict the um, the premise NE, I think. Yes, yes. I mean, again, that, that, that would just be to accept panpsychism. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, Strawson actually does have an answer to the concerns about this appeal to intuition um, there. Um, so, yeah, any, any other comments about that section? He does talk a bit about um, neutral monism. Um, it's been ages since I've like read anything on neutral monism though, and I'm, I'm like, I'm, I, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't really have much to say about that. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about it. Uh, I don't think I have much to say about it. No. Uh, it seemed like <clears throat> it made sense, his response, I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the neutral monist, like, just, and again, I, it's been a while since I've, I, I'm not sure if I'm, well, I, I, I'm kind of going with what Strawson's characterization is, but <laughs> the, the neutral monist is going to say that fundamentally reality is like neither mental nor physical, it's something else. So it's mm -hmm. it's like there's neither the mental properties nor the physical properties. There's like these Z properties. But mm -hmm. the problem is that for neutral monism to be at all plausible, those Z properties are going to have to turn out to just be experiential properties, in which case you've just got panpsychism under a different name. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah, um, it's, it yeah. seems to be basically the same sort of argument he's just, just made about the proto-experiential uh, position. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so that uh, will bring us to the final section, uh, micro-psychism. Um, and I think that, so, a, uh, uh, where am I? So a lot of this, uh, first I think he's sort of summarizing what he's kind of already said. Um, there's an interesting point though so he, he the point of this view micropsychism micropsychism is just the view that um there are like some fundamental particles that have experiential properties that is not yet panpsychism because panpsychism is going to claim that they all have experiential properties all of the fundamental particles um so how do we get from micropsychism to panpsychism uh this is on page 25 uh he says basically if you if you accept mic micropsychism but not panpsychism then there is what strawson calls a a radical heterogeneity at the very bottom of things um yeah he says it, it you know it, it would it would be it would look like the idea that some physical ultimates are spatiotemporal and some aren't and that's just bizarre i don't know this seemed like a really flimsy justification for a very big step to me. Um, well, I think like if you have, um, I don't know if this is, like is too much of a sketch, but if someone said like, oh, only one of the fundamental fields, only one of the fundamental particles is experiential and the other ones aren't, it doesn't really seem to be much of a victory over panpsychism because that's still like a field that's extended over like the whole world. Um, I think put another way, like, um, if you if you're like oh I'm not a I'm not gonna endorse panpsychism because it's too weird so I'm just gonna be a micropsychic or whatever uh, then like micropsychism is still about as weird yeah um, <laughs> so I think he's saying like well micropsychism and panpsychism are both weird but panpsychism seems less arbitrary I yeah I mean I can I can agree with that I just 
I don't, I don't know. Uh, again, maybe I'm just more inclined to be agnostic about this sort of thing. I don't, I don't really see why it's a problem if there's a bit of arbitrariness in the world. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's a that's a fair point. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm not sure what does does that, I think I don't think everything has like mass, for example, does it? There are some massless particles. I mean, why couldn't mm -hmm. there be particles that are experiential and particles that aren't? Like, mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> uh, Yeah, I think even uh, even if he doesn't like succeed in um, establishing a preference for psychism um, over micropsychism, it's it's still pretty weird. I feel like micropsychism like gets the spirit of panpsychism. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. like if you've got a successful argument for micropsychism, that's a really substantial <laughs> like, that's a really <laughs> substantial conclusion. I mean, well done. You know, yeah. that's 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 a great conclusion. Um, so I I just yeah, I think he he just seemed to be kind of committing himself to. You know, it didn't seem to me that there was there was the justification for taking that further step, um, but I agree that the the difference between micropsychism and panpsychism is is not that important. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so. The next thing Strawson does is discuss a couple of problems for uh, panpsychism, and um, I mean these were sort of the, the the end of my notes on on this paper. But this is sort of starting around page twenty six. One of the problems he raises is that panpsychism uh, seems to commit us to a very large number of subjects of experience. So the thought is you, you're not going to have an experience without an experiencer. Um, mm -hmm. So in, if, you, if you're saying that an electron has experience or subjectivity, then is, it's going to be a subject of experience. And that apparently is a problem, although I don't, I, I just don't have the intuition that that's a problem at all. I think if you accept, like, it just seems to me like once you've accepted that experience, an electron can have experience, I don't see what the big deal is about saying it's a subject of experience. But maybe I'm think... missing something there. I, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think another fun move that could be available would be to just say, like, you can have experiences without experiencers, and they can just, like, float free. <laughs> um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, well, I don't know. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Because, um, like, what, I don't know. What, what would that be? So an experience floating free. I guess the problem is that if you're thinking of an electron as something that has experience, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an extremely simple experience. Like, we're not going to be supposing that an electron has a self or something like that right um yeah. maybe it's just gonna be like there's 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 some sort of subjectivity there or uh yeah I, I don't know it didn't seem like a big problem to me um yeah but apparently that is a problem uh that, i guess i can see how that would be a problem like with some intuitions of like subjects being inseparable or whatever um and how like you could have it would be weird if you had that sort of intuition to think that, well, you can have an electron be a subject, but it can also compose a larger subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, no, that that is a I'm I think a big problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, actually, Strawson kind of hints at this problem. I think um, uh, when, when I mean, in fact, well, later on page twenty six, he says, in general, we will have to wonder how macro experientiality arises from micro experientiality, and. Mm -hmm there's there is this general problem of well okay how do you how do you account for for the emergence of complex experientiality out of the simple experientiality um mm -hmm. like strawson thinks that that's intelligible um i i'm i'm kind of not sure that i that i get that that's any more intelligible than uh the you know the, 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 the emergence of experientiality out of the non-experiential. Um, yeah, so it's... I, well, I don't know. What, what, what did you think about that? <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have, like, a couple separate thoughts because it's it seems to be, like, we're saying, okay, we don't want experience to come out of nothing. It needs to come from something that's kind of experience-y yes. uh, in the constituent parts of the, of the whole. Um... But since we can't really spell out how such like composition would work, um, it's still 
<laughs> but still kind of a, an unexplainedness there that I think an opponent could exploit. They could be like, oh, well, if... Because... Um, well, I'm trying to find the words, but the idea here is that... Um, if you say that the fundamental particles are mental in some way, then it can get its men the larger, like the brain can get its mentality from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. It feels it feels a little bit like like we're thinking of mentality like it's water going through pipes or something, where it needs it needs to come from somewhere. Um, but I don't I don't know if that characterization is justified. Sorry, I got kind of tangled up but i i see there the lack of an of a precise explanation for how smaller experiences could compose larger experiences i think that's like a big a big gap there yeah yeah no i i, I totally get what you mean and it's it's especially a problem i think given that strawson's argument against physicalism appealed precisely to the unintelligible well standard physicalism appealed precisely to the unintelligibility of you know, the experiential arising from the non-experiential. It's like, well, yeah, okay, but oh, uh, did you just yeah, realize something? Thought. Or yeah, because I remember he made a distinction between like an epistemic uh, un unintelligibility, <laughs> uh, epistemic intelligibility, and metaphysical intelligibility, or like yeah. um, epistemic something is epistemically intelligible if you can actually like. Um, intellige it. <laughs> That's not a verb, but I'll use it. Um, but it's metaphysically intelligible if it could, in principle, like by a maximally knowing entity, be known. Yeah, I think because... this is just a. I think this is on page. Um, uh, Whereas it's like fourteen and fifteen when he discusses his previous argument. Um, sorry to interrupt, just to, so people know where that is. No, no, go ahead. Um, that was all I was just saying. Where that part occurred. Uh, so I think um, it is, uh, again, prima facie viscerally, it is intelligible that, or it seems plausible that it would be metaphysically intelligible to get um, to get experience from experience, because they're kind of the same kind of thing. You're getting like from like. Um, and I think that's more plausible than that it would be intelligible to get experience from something that has no remnant or semblance to it whatsoever. Yeah, um, are they? Yeah, yeah, okay, I can see. I, I think, like, like maybe... Because like, hmm. there's, there's the other point, though, that... I mean, when you say you're getting like from like, mm -hmm. you, can, you can sort of always define the kind that you're talking about in a broader and broader way, so that... Mm -hmm you're always getting like like if you if you would say well um both experience and non-experience are concrete spatio-temporally located things uh, so you're getting like from like do you see what yeah. i mean <laughs> right like you yeah, can, yeah, you can yeah. kind of always make that that move um yeah that's a fair point i think hmm okay the the really the really like difficult turning turning point here is getting a from b when you get when you get A from B, there needs to be some sort of explanation for how you get um, A from B. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess one question that can come up is like, well, how good of an explanation and at what level? And I think like Strawson gives a sketch where it's like, oh, well, if um, if you can just describe B fully using terms that are only used to describe A or whatever. Yeah. I might have flipped the order there, but but I, I do think more work could be could be done there. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it, it strikes me as 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 a bit of a as a bit of a difficulty. Uh, mm -hmm. I I don't know. I just don't find it intuitive or intelligible to see. Like, although, do I? I'm not sure. Do, actually, <laughs> one of the things that makes this really difficult for me is that Strawson says himself. So he commits himself to this view that um, this is on page twenty six. He says. Uh, Panpsychism certainly does not require one to hold the view that things like stones and tables are subjects of experience. I don't believe this for a moment, and it receives no support from the current line of thought. And and I was like, well, okay, but w w why would these not be subjects of experience? Like, because I can kind of imagine, I can kind of imagine experience aggregating, like mass or charge or something like that. That 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 sort of 
I can I can sort of see that. I, 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 maybe I've got some some sort of intelligibility there if it if it aggregates like those. But if you're going to hold but a position then, yeah. where there's just fundamental particles have experience, and so do like brains and maybe some other you know complicated things that you find in biological organisms. Wh why? I mean that that seems really bizarre. I, to me. Yeah. Hmm. I think. Uh, one one gut feeling initial move would be like, well, but brains have like all of these structures that let it have a more like intelligible, a more more structured sort of experience. Like the the connections that the brain makes are maybe more suited for more sophisticated experience than um, than the structure of a table. But yeah. as I'm saying it, it just it feels too convenient. No, I I mean I, I totally agree with you. Like absolutely, brains have in have the complexity of structure to support really complex experience like i i imagine mm -hmm. the experience of a table uh, you know if it makes sense to talk about that is going to be really really simple i just yeah. don't i don't see why you're how you're ruling that out um yeah yeah i mean i yeah i, I don't know about that part so that's one of the reasons i think why i find it difficult to kind of conceive of how strawson's universe is supposed to work uh, mm -hmm. um yeah. Uh, all right then. Well, I I think that was like the, the, sort of the end of my notes about this. Um, Strawson does say some other stuff about like general approaches to metaphysics. I didn't really make any notes on that. Um, mm -hmm. um, so that's that's what I've got to say about it. Um, if there's anything else, any you know any any other comments about Strawson in general or uh, the I have one argument? One parting concern um, before going to get dinner and stuff. Uh, I think that so Strawson kind of rags on property dualism for a little bit, saying like, "Well, property dualism is just like substance dualism under other clothes or whatever." But it does seem like this this monism where um, things have these um, intrinsic properties and these extrinsic properties, these experiential ones and non-experiential ones that. I don't know, that that just seems like a dualism to me, um, where yeah, it it seems very close to a property dualism, and my worry there, um, which is something that's always like at the back of at the front of my mind uh, when doing philosophy of mind is if we get epiphenomenalism, because um, if we have if it is true that the experiential is gotten from intrinsic properties of um, of the physical world then, well, those in intrinsic properties can't have any causal effect, or they wouldn't be intrinsic, I think. M maybe, that's, maybe that move is fallacious, but if we allow that move that, well, intrinsic means it can't be causal, because to be causal you need to interact with something else, then I don't know how we could even, like, talk about it. I don't know how yeah. we could talk about those, like, non-causal concrete things. I think the way to defend that move that you made would just be to say, well, if it if it were causal, you'd be able to detect it physically, right? But I mean, part of Strawson's argument is precisely that physics right, only detects the you know the relational properties, it doesn't detect the intrinsic properties. Presumably, the intrinsic properties are going to count as non-causal. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And yeah, and I think my big problem with that is that if something is concrete but causal, I have no idea how we can refer. Um, well, I guess, yeah. I mean, you fix that. You can fix the reference to, um, like, uh, experientiality. Like, you can talk about experiential properties because w we undergo experiential properties. Like, we have direct access to the experiential properties of brain states. Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't know if there's... like is, is there then a problem of just attributing those properties to other things? Wouldn't it be like how we can talk about how there are, you know, galaxies and stars outside of the observable universe. Um, well, I think one one thought there is that um, if we do have access, like we do have access, first-hand access to um, our experiences and such, but if that access like um, has some causal impact on the brain, then you would be having the intrinsic properties having a causal effect which is very weird um or put another way insofar as utterances are like 
physical phenomena, physical causal phenomena. And insofar as experience is intrinsic and thus like non-causal, there I think there's a very strong tension there. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. That's a good point. And yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, I, th I think that's that's maybe a, a good uh, a good point to to end on. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, all right. Oh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, hope.